hello and welcome back to LCC Academy. Uh, welcome to those who have been joining us, not just for one week, but I think it's been six weeks already uh, that we've had this going on. So welcome back. And if it's your first time, then welcome. Uh, we are happy to have you here. My name is Kate Petrikiena. I am an admissions counselor at LCC International University, and we are the ones um, organizing this whole thing. And um, this is really just a lecture series that you can get to know um, the lectures, uh, the lecture style and the classroom uh, atmosphere of LCC and just talk about relevant, uh, relevant and current topics. So for those of you who are new, I'll just give a brief introduction about LCC. We are located in Klaipeda, Lithuania. So that is a city that is by the seaside uh, in, in Lithuania, one of the Baltic countries, for those of you who don't know. Uh, this is, these are a few photos from our city. Um, it's a really beautiful old town that is all really close to uh, our university campus. And we're also very close to the seaside. And here is our campus itself. We have a full campus that is equipped with two dormitories, an academic building, and also sports hall and other, other um, in, the, in the other building. And just a bit about LCC, we have a pretty unique educational model for our region. Uh, and we're quite proud to be able to say we are um, the only North American style university in the region. Uh, we are uh, also international university. So about North American style, what that means is um, not only that we were founded by uh, Lithuanians and North Americans from the United States and Canada, but um, just the structure of the classroom and how professors relate with their um, students is based on the North American style. So there's a lot of uh, classroom interaction, um, the way the classes are structured uh, are, are more of a North American style. You don't come to just some lectures and then an exam and everything is related to the exam at the end of the semester, but you are engaged constantly in the class every week um, and have different projects and group projects and, and so on uh, throughout the semester as well. And we're a liberal arts university. So that, if you don't know or aren't familiar with the term liberal arts, it basically just means that we give a broad basis of education. Uh, so you have a major or a program that you choose. And then within that major, you get to sample uh, different parts of that field. And outside of the major, you have classes that all students take uh, that aren't related to your major. So we really believe this, uh, this prepares our students not only for the field that they're going to be in to be excellent employees, but um, it really prepares them for the very diverse and varied life that the 21st century um, gives us. We're international, as I said, we have 53 countries represented in our student body this year. And um, it's a really unique environment where we can learn about different cultures and really come together on the campus and and um, uh, grow and learn together. We're a Christian university. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to be Christian, but we have certain values like um, the human dignity and respect to one another, um, honesty, integrity, and, and, and much more. Uh, and we welcome each one who comes into our doors to explore their beliefs and, um, and just to come with an open mind um, to one another. We're accredited in the EU and recognized worldwide. What that means is our diploma is uh, an EU accredited diploma. You can go anywhere in the EU and uh, it will be accepted where, where you go, but uh, we have students finishing and graduating LCC and, and going all over the place, quite literally for further studies or, or just back to their home countries or other countries for work. And, um, and our diploma is, is usually accepted with no problems. 
the big highlight about LCC is also that we're relational. We're not a big university, and we actually think that's a really big plus because uh, we can keep our interactions um, very personal, so your professors will know you, and um, you will know most of your classmates and your course mates that you start and finish uh, your studies with. And there are tons of different activities going on outside and inside the classroom that you can be a part of. And briefly, our academic programs. We have business administration, so anything related to marketing, economics, accounting, and so on. Contemporary communication, which is related to a lot of different things, but uh, public relations, um, graphic design, social media, and uh, even video production uh, go into that major. We have English language and literature. So if you're interested just in the language, the grammar, the literature itself, or in translation or teaching, um, that could be a good fit for you. And international relations and development. So this has to do with politics uh, and both governmental and non-governmental organizations and uh, economical development as well. Psychology, so anything in the broad field of psychology, if that's interesting, uh, you should definitely check that major out. Uh, so that can be from counseling to um, you know, neuroscience. Um, this will give you a good broad uh, basis for going on in that field. And last but definitely not least, theology. So that is um, mostly Christian theology, I would say, and uh, religious studies and biblical studies. We do also have master's degrees, but I'm guessing most of you, it's not as relevant, but just so you know, we also have a master's um, in international management and TESOL, and those are online, mostly online programs. So that's all about LCC for now. Uh, I would like to say, uh, as you're joining today, we're going to be talking uh, about managing change and trans transitions and our Professor Therese Cox will be sharing uh, with us about that. And she is a professor from, uh, or lecturer from the Prime program, which is an intensive English program that we have at LCC. If your English level uh, is not quite, quite strong enough to, to um, learn at an academic English setting. Therese, the floor is yours, please. Welcome, we are very happy to have you today. Great, thank you so much, Kate, um, for the invitation and for the warm welcome. It is so good to be with you all uh, today. So change, transitions, sometimes they are welcomed and sometimes they are a surprise. Sometimes they feel really small and sometimes they feel huge. Sometimes small changes or transitions disturb our lives in surprising ways. And even some changes that seem good and some that seem bad, but regardless of whether a transition feels good or bad, it can be hard to navigate. So why is that? And how can we manage change and transitions well? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about today. If you have ever been to the beach or to the desert, you've probably noticed how quickly the sand can move or change. The wind blows and the sand blows. The waves come and the sand on the beach moves and changes. Similar to the sand on the beach or in the desert, change is all around us. It's happening all the time. But what is it? What is change? What is transition? And what does each one mean? Well, let's take a look at a couple of definitions. The definition of change is an act or process through which something becomes different. And then transition is the process or period of changing from one state or condition to another. So let's look at these a bit closer. Change often implies a specific point or an act, but as we see from the definition, both change and transition can be a process. Both change can be both an act, an individual act, but also a process. It can be a specific point or it can be something that's much, much longer. 
And also both change and transition require that something different happens in the process. Something different is the end result after a change or a transition happens. There was an article in The Atlantic this past September that said this about transitions. Transitions are some of the most difficult periods in our lives. Even when we choose them, the disequilibrium they bring can be painful or frightening. And when they're imposed on us, when we don't choose them, they can be even more distressing. This word disequilibrium captured my attention because it's this feeling that we're not quite settled, we're out of balance, we're in limbo. And this is the feeling that we often have when we're experiencing a change or a transition. So this is my sweet family. My husband, Michael, teaches here at LCC in the theology department. And as you've heard, I teach in the prime program here at LCC. And we have three sons. Um, we moved with our boys to Klaipeda, Lithuania from the United States about two years ago. And we've been through a lot of change and transition in the past few years, as you can imagine, moving to a different culture, right? It's a big transition or change. But I wanna tell you as we get started about one transition in my life that took me on a journey of learning more about how, how to handle transitions in our lives well. And it's partly because of this journey over the past five to seven years uh, that we have been able to enter into this season of moving cultures into a different country, city, region of the world that has made these transitions these past few years even possible. So I'm not an expert on change and transition, but I'm interested in the topic and I've explored it some both personally and academically, but really my interest comes from my own experience. And my hope is that as we're together here for a bit this afternoon, that it will open space for us to learn and to think about our own transitions in our lives. So about the time this picture was taken, you just saw my boys, none of them are that um, small anymore. But in the, when this picture was taken, I found myself in a major season of transition. And they were all supposedly good transitions but I couldn't figure out why it felt so hard. Why I felt like I was just slogging my way through life. I don't know if uh, where you live, you've had as much snow as we have in Klaipeda, but uh, we've had quite a bit of snow this winter and I've often um, continued to go for runs in the snow. And sometimes when there's like a bit of snow, it feels like it's like hard to make traction and move forward. Well, that's how I found I felt at this season in my life, like I was just slogging through life, that the pace of life was going faster, but I just couldn't move more quickly. Our youngest son was about six months old in this picture during this time. And um, during this time, things shifted. I was working at a university and things shifted in the university. Uh, our university had a new president or rector, and I was suddenly working for a new vice president. And in the midst of that change, he offered me a new job. It was actually a promotion. It was something that was supposed to be really exciting, right? When you're promoted to a position with more uh, responsibility and higher pay and all of this, it's supposed to be really exciting. But instead, I didn't feel very excited. These things were supposed to be really good. But to make a long story short, this started, this promotion, this job change started a season of transition that just kind of tore me apart in lots of ways. In fact, I tried to quit the job several times before I even started it. I mean, who does that? But in the midst of all this internal turmoil, I met a very special person, um, Dr. Deb Caldwell, who teaches at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the Chicago area in the United States. And in a very brief conversation with her, she could see what was going on in this inner turmoil so much more clearly than I could. And through a conversation with her and her encouragement, I began exploring this idea of managing transition. 
So she pointed me towards a couple of books written by William Bridges. Um, and I found out later that she uses these books as so she's coaching um, businesses and business leaders as well as individuals. And reading and doing more study on transitions made a lot of sense out of not only my current season, but also past seasons and past experiences. One reason is because I thought that if a change was small or if it was supposed to be good, that there was nothing to worry about, that I didn't need to really pay attention to the change. But I quickly learned that transitions can be both good or bad, and they can also be big or small, and they can impact our lives and bring this feeling of disequilibrium or imbalance, whether they're good or bad, or big or small. So let's make a list together. I wanna to try something with technology that hopefully will work. Um, so when you think about a season of change or transition, what comes to your mind? So this can be something that is good or something that is bad, something that is big or something that is small. So um, you can enter your responses. We're gonna make a word cloud together if this works out using menti.com. So um, in the chat, you should see a link um, to how to do this, but you can also scan this QR code. So I invite you to add your responses and we'll take a look at these in a few minutes. So as you're adding your responses, I am um, going to give a few more examples and maybe this will also help spark your imagination. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, a transition can be good or bad. So here are a few examples and maybe even some that you have experienced. So one example of a transition that many of us would consider bad is the divorce of parents. So this, the divorce of parents can create this sort of disequilibrium in our lives. It can mean a lot of transition in our relationships or our living situation. Another example of a seemingly negative or bad transition is a failing grade on an exam. This transition might lead to other transitions, like needing to retake a class or retake an exam or attend a remedial course. Another potentially bad example is the sickness of a family member. For example, if a family member was recently diagnosed with cancer, this might bring about a lot of changes or transition in an entire family. Maybe it means that you are gonna help at home in a different way, or that one of your parents has additional doctor's appointments and isn't available, or that your parent feels really tired and isn't able to function in the same way that he or she did before. Or maybe, given the time that we're living in right now, a family member is diagnosed with COVID and suddenly your entire family has to isolate together. But transitions are not all bad. Some of them are seemingly good from the outside. They seem good to us. So for example, maybe um, you or a family member gets a new job. This is a seemingly good transition. Maybe you begin dating someone, right? Again, a good transition. Or maybe you decide to apply to LCC and begin studying at university. And that might mean maybe even in a different city or a different country. So these can be good or bad, but they can still bring about this disequilibrium or disruption in our lives. Transitions can also be big or they can feel small. So using some of our examples from the previous slide, um, for example, a big transition might be the divorce of parents or beginning university studies. Another big transition might be moving to a new city or to a new country. These all might feel quite big and create a lot of disruption in our lives. But maybe a transition could feel quite small, like a new class or a new teacher. As a university teacher, every semester, I have a new class of students. This isn't a major transition, but it is a transition each and every semester. 
or maybe a new relationship with a new neighbor or a classmate could be another smaller transition that we might experience. However, regardless of whether a transition feels big or feels small, it can also bring disruption or disequilibrium in our lives. So let's take a small example from nature to help us think a bit more deeply about why it is important for us to manage transitions well. So I have often heard that a pearl is formed by a tiny grain of sand irritating or disrupting the inside of an oyster. But more likely the cause is that a tiny organism, like what you see in this video, disrupts the mantle tissues inside the oyster. And so then the oyster creates a pearl sac around the disturbance. Then the oyster secretes a substance similar to what is on the inside of the shell, like you see in this video now. And it takes several years for thousands of layers of this substance to build up over time just to create one pearl. In an oyster, a tiny disturbance, a small change can start the process to create something beautiful, to create something that is treasured or valuable. And so I wonder, if we pay attention to the disturbances in our lives, whether they're big or small or good or bad, what might form in us over time? Maybe something beautiful, maybe a treasure. That is why this topic is so important for all of us, no matter our age, our stage in life, all of us face changes and transitions all the time. And the question is, what will form in us over time? Fear, frustration, anger, or maybe resilience, determination, and hope. So let's take just a minute to look at the transitions you all named in the Mentimeter and see what we have noticed. Okay, so. Let's see if I can successfully navigate, navigate this. Okay, so on the screen, on the Mentimeter, I'm seeing lots of different uh, changes that you have mentioned already. And these are really great. So I see some that we've mentioned already, the divorce of parents. But I also see others changing schools or starting a new school. These are really big changes. Adding a new sibling to the family. This is also a really big change. Traveling or an exchange program. Again, this is, this is a transition or a change. This disrupts us. We move to a different location and we notice, right? That this does something to our balance. Um, yeah, a fight with a friend group. So even a shift in our relationships, maybe a relationship that feels normal to us, this can cause disequilibrium or feel like a transition. Losing an important person in our lives, this can also be a big transition or change. Figuring out what does it look like to live life, to move forward, to embrace our life when we have lost something that's really significant to us. I also see moving houses, right? Moving from one apartment to another or from one house to another. Our family has done that a couple of times in the last few years, maybe like four times in the last couple of years. And that also is a big transition and can take, can be a process to accept and to embrace that new transition. Great, these are all wonderful examples. Thank you everybody for adding in your examples. These are super helpful. So now that we've seen some of your examples, um, I, one thing I do want to point out from those examples is that sometimes we are not just going through one of those things at a time. Sometimes we're going through more than one. And when we add them all together, it can feel like a lot. If I have lost a significant relationship in my life, 
and moved to a new location and had a new um, sibling born. These are three big things in and of themselves. And then when you add them all together, it can feel like a lot. So how can we manage these kinds of transitions? Well, in um, his book, William Bridges talks about uh, three phases of transition. And we are gonna talk through each of these phases, what each of these phases look like and what it looks like for us to manage and move through those transitions well. So here is a really helpful diagram. At least I think it's helpful. Um, William Bridges' work has revealed these three transition phases. And the idea is that you're moving through these transitions horizontally, but that movement through these phases can look different depending on the person and the transition. So a person might actually never move out of the ending phase where they're experiencing loss and trying to let go. They might actually never move into the neutral zone. They might just stay in this ending phase. Or a person might see a transition from the beginning as a new beginning and never actually go through the other stages. But honestly, this isn't very common. Most of us go through most of these stages with each transition, whether we're, we're aware of it or whether we handle it well or not. So we'll talk a bit more about the neutral zone and the new beginning in a minute. But first, let's consider this first phase. And I'm gonna give a brief example. Um, in the fall, so a few months ago, I was talking with a student and we'll call him George. So at this point, George was in the midst of thinking about a recent job. Um, he had recently accepted a new job position. He's also a full-time student. And when I asked him how he felt about this change, he started to name some of the losses that would be part of this change. So he was here on the diagram. He was in this ending phase. And through the course of our conversation, someone else, let's call him Michael, made a comment about the positive side of this change. It was an innocent comment, but Michael was trying to shift the conversation towards seeing this as a new beginning, rather than staying where George was at in the ending phase. Michael was trying to drag George into the new beginning phase by helping him see what was positive about this change. And this is just a small example of something that happens all the time. From the outside, something might seem like a new beginning. It might seem really positive. This change is so good. So we might move straight into naming the benefits or the good. And in this good change, when we haven't actually take, taken time to first name what is ending, to name the losses. People on the outside of transitions are quick to name it as a new beginning, especially when the change is positive. But we ourselves need to make space to name the losses and to make space for others to also name losses. We need to take time to consider what is left behind, particularly in positive transitions or changes. In Bridges' work, he uncovers five costs of not managing transitions well. Those are guilt, resentment, anxiety, self-absorption, so being completely absorbed with ourselves, or stress. So instead of growing like a pearl with resilience, with determination, with hope, we might find instead that we're growing resentment or anxiety or lots of feelings of guilt. And I often have noticed these in myself when I haven't managed a transition well. So because of these potential costs, it is important for us to move through these three phases well in our lives. So how can we go about that? We might um, in phase one, in this ending phase, really see a lot of loss and the need to figure out what it looks like to let go, to let go of an old way of doing something or to let go of an old identity. We might find in this phase feelings of disengagement. So if we have experienced an ending such as a divorce or a death of somebody that we love, a job change, a move, an illness, 
or even something that is a smaller event. These might disengage us from the context that we have known ourselves in. And it, we might suddenly feel like we are disengaged from what's right in front of us. In this phase, it is important for us to name our losses. So we might be like this guy in the photo, carrying around lots of losses with us. We can't even see where we're going, but we might not even know what's inside those boxes. We might be carrying around these boxes, these losses without even knowing what's inside of them. So without naming our losses, we'll continue to carry them around with us. We can't let go of something that we don't know is actually there. So it's important for us to ask ourselves questions, to name, what am I losing? What is ending here? What do I need to let go of? So in the example earlier that someone gave a new sibling. So when I think about welcoming a new sibling into my family, what am I losing? Maybe I'm losing quiet because there's now a baby who cries a lot. Maybe my relationship with my parents is changing. And so it's an end of a phase in our relationship. Is there something that I need to let go of in order to embrace this new sibling in my life? Do I need to let go of some of my um, selfishness that I want the attention of my parents or I want things to be quiet all the time? So thinking about these questions as we consider a transition in our lives. So let's look at another example. So one example that most of us can relate to because we have all lived in the world this past year is COVID-19. So COVID has disrupted the lives of most people in the world in lots of ways. And for many of us, that has looked like remote schooling or remote learning. COVID has led schools to be closed all over the world. And there are a lot of losses connected with schools being closed to in-person learning. And I don't know what your particular situation has looked like, but here in Lithuania, that has meant um, my kids have been studying remotely for the past, um, since January. And in this, there are a lot of losses. If you've been studying remotely, you might be able to, be able to identify with some of these. A loss of normal routines, a loss of connection with teachers or with friends, a loss of a more active lifestyle maybe, sports activities that used to be part of your daily life or maybe walking to school, no longer are those part of your life. Even a loss of knowledge. We can't learn or accomplish as much in a day when we're doing it through a screen, when we're not in person with one another. And we could probably name many more losses connected with COVID. This is just a small piece of one loss connected with COVID. But when we are in the early phases of a transition, it's important to stop and to name these losses rather than just carry them around like those boxes everywhere we go. So what are some steps that we can take in this first phase, in the ending phase? One thing that we've just talked about is naming the losses, both personally or sometimes with other people. We can also mark endings. Maybe we need to celebrate something. Uh, in the midst of remote learning in the early stages, we celebrated the end of every single week because we had made it through another week. So maybe we need to pause and celebrate something. Maybe we need to share memories or look at old photos. Maybe we need to uh, think about the past, but also treat it with, with respect instead of um, grumbling about the past to make us feel better about the, the present, also treat it with respect. And maybe we need to take a piece of the old with us into this new um, transition or beginning. Okay, so the next phase in this transition process is called the neutral zone. And this is the fuzziest and messiest space of all. And honestly, I think the one that often of us, often we go through and we don't even realize it. So in phase two in the neutral zone, um, this is where we feel like we're in between. So we've had to end something, let go of something, but we can't fully embrace this new beginning. Psychologists call this a space of liminality where we're kind of living in limbo in between. So the old is gone, but we're not fully operational in the new. In this phase, in the neutral zone, people often feel more anxious. They often feel disoriented or confused. They often feel less productive. 
they might miss work or school more than normal. Their productivity might suffer. They might not be able to accomplish as much as they used to in one day or in one hour. They might also feel less energy, feel really drained. So if you have ever been in the midst of a transition and you just said, I am just so tired all the time, probably you were in the neutral zone. This is a common experience in the midst of the neutral zone. The neutral zone is a space where you just feel blah. You're not quite sure um, why, but you just feel blah all the time. So one example of transition could be, um, and the space in the neutral zone could be a square morphing into a circle. So it seems fairly easy, a square becoming a circle, if you watch this video, right? But the process is actually quite complex. So in this diagram, it shows the process of a square becoming, changing into a circle as it relates to transition. So you see the, the square as this phase of endings, and then the square being broken up into little pieces and finally being put back together into a circle until it eventually becomes a whole circle, which is the new beginning. So if we think about these endings as this breaking apart of what was familiar and normal, in the neutral zone, we are in a space of trying to put a, back together, reconfigure what is broken, but we don't fully see the end result yet. It's not fully a circle again. It's this middle space where these pieces are being put back together that can feel really messy and really confusing. But the good news is that it can also be a space of creativity where we're putting the pieces back together, but we're doing it in creative ways. So let's look at our example again of the transition to, from in-person learning to remote learning, one that many of us have experienced. So in this phase, we might find that we feel really tired, as we mentioned earlier, or that we don't want to go to class, or maybe we miss class, we sleep through class. We might also be in class, but be completely disengaged from what we're learning. Something um, that used to feel easy to us, maybe writing or a language class or math might suddenly feel really hard in a different format. We also might find that we feel more anxious than normal. Maybe it has something to do with, to do with the screen in front of us, but maybe also it has something to do with the fact that we have been through a major change in our education process. That all of these are a normal part of the transition process. It's normal to feel these things. And there are ways that we can move forward into the next phase of new beginnings. One mistake that we often make is that we give up in this place of the neutral zone, that we quit. But actually it is in this place that we can be more creative and develop new ideas. So what can we do in the neutral zone to help us out? Here are a few steps that we can take. Um, we can remind ourselves that it is normal. It is normal to feel this way. And sometimes it is important to just say that to ourselves. We can also notice places where we have negative thinking and we can shift those to a more positive metaphor. So one example I have is that when my family was preparing for our tr transition to move to Lithuania, I had in my mind, we were coming in January, which is one of the darkest and coldest times in the year in Lithuania. So I had in my mind that we were just entering into this dark hole. And instead of imagining transition as entering into a dark hole, I need to shift my metaphor. So instead of envisioning a dark hole, I shifted my metaphor to the warm glow of a candle. And so our family started the practice of lighting a candle in the evening every night when it was dark, um, partially because of our Christian faith to remind us of God's presence with us, but also as a metaphor of this warm, intimate candle, instead of envisioning our transition as this hole that we're falling into, into darkness, but instead as this really special, um, warm space that we were going to enter into together. Other things we can do are to create temporary systems. So 
I have done this each time the regulations have changed in quarantine in Lithuania. Each time I shift based on those regulations um, to help me navigate what can feel disorienting as regulations change. Other things that we can do are to get outside and to connect with other people. So the neutral zone can be a really lonely phase. So getting outside, making being with others, however possible, a priority is really helpful. During quarantine this last fall, our family went on a walk in the forest every afternoon at about the same time. So this helped us create something normal in our lives, a temporary rhythm in the midst of lots of feelings of disorientation or abnormal. And as I mentioned earlier, this is also a space for creativity. So we can, um, I've seen this in remote teaching and a remote learning for our kids. It's in this sort of messy space of trying to figure things out and put the pieces back together that I'm inspired to try new things, to realize that that didn't work in my class and I should try something different. So it's also in this, uh, this neutral zone space that we can experiment and to try new things and be creative. So, once we are in the neutral zone, what does that look like for us to move out of that into the final phase, the new beginning? So in the new beginning, at this stage can feel very refreshing to us after being in a disorienting phase of the neutral zone for so long. Often in the new beginning phase, we might actually find a new identity. We realize that we found out something new about ourselves that we didn't know before. Maybe we really like like leading a team for a group, group project, or maybe we've really discovered a passion for working with children or developing websites. Often in this phase, we can realize that our energy is back. And once again, we have a sense of purpose in our lives or in our work. We're actually excited about what's happening in the present and not just looking at the past or to the future, but we're excited about what's happening right now. One thing that is helpful to do in this phase is to actually reflect on our season of transition. What did you learn? What was hopeful? Um, what are you hopeful for now? How can you navigate the next transition or change in your life? So find a way to celebrate or to mark this new beginning in some way. It could also be something simple, like making a meal with friends or buying a small plant to remind you of this season. One of my goals to mark, uh, I haven't done it yet, but to mark the one year of COVID in our world actually is to walk to the store and to buy a small ca cactus plant because it has felt in many ways like this last year has um, felt like a desert in some places. It's been dry as we've been um, distanced from other people and from our families. But I also want to remember all that I've learned in this season and to mark that even with something simple like a cactus plant. So in this phase, in the third phase of new beginnings, um, let's go back to our example. So um, in this phase, we might feel that we have renew renewed energy, even in remote learning. We might also feel like we have found a new normal. We figured out how to cope with the challenges and um, make the most out of our situation. Someone recently told me that her son really likes remote learning and will be sad when he has to return to in-person school. And at first I was really surprised by this, but then I realized that actually it makes a lot of sense. He's finally embraced remote learning as a new beginning and actually returning to school would be yet another transition or change that would bring loss in this space in the neutral zone again. So it makes sense that this might feel comfortable because we've embraced it as a new beginning. So let's take one final example in our last few minutes together and walk through this diagram with a transition that might be coming for you sometime in the future. So let's consider this example. You are graduating from high school and you are beginning university, hopefully here at LCC. So if that's the case, um, for most students, um, there is a lot of excitement over ending high school and beginning university. They hit a point um, though where often the excitement fades where they realize I've been so excited about this, now it's come, oh my, what have I done? So let's um, name our person who's walking through this transition, Dasha. 
So Dasha decides to begin her studies maybe here at LCC in the fall. And Dasha might be super excited about this opportunity, but then suddenly she might be surprised because she was supposed to be excited, but suddenly she feels a bit lost. So what does Dasha do? Here are some losses in phase one in the ending phase that Dasha might be able to name. Loss of connection with friends or family. Maybe instead of living with them, she's now trying to call them and isn't able to connect with them in the same way. Loss of what is familiar. Maybe my high school and my friendships there or my city was really familiar, but now I'm in a place where none of that is the same. A loss of confidence. I felt confident in my studies and in my place in my school before, but now that I'm in university, I don't feel confident in what I know or what I've learned anymore. Or maybe a loss of dependence. I was dependent on my family for food and now I have to make all my own meals. How am I going to do that? So naming those losses would be an important step for Dasha to take. Dasha could also mark the ending. So celebrating the shift in her life, sharing memories maybe from high school with friends and with family. She could also take something, a piece of the old and bring it with her. When I moved to Lithuania, I brought my favorite teacup, which is a small thing, but it was one small old piece that I could bring with me to help me feel comfort or a bit of security in the midst of lots of change. Then after Dasha's named her losses and she's let go of some of these things that she's lost, she might not feel so sad, but she might still feel a bit blah and in the neutral zone. So in this phase, uh, Dasha might feel really tired as we've talked about before. She might not wanna go to class or she might um, realize that something that was once easy is now hard. She might feel like she's made a big mistake in coming to university. So what steps can Dasha take in the neutral zone? Dasha can remind herself that this is normal. It is normal to feel this way and everybody will feel this way eventually. She can also notice if she's thinking some negative things and to shift those to more positive metaphors. She can create some temporary systems or rhythms. Maybe that means going to bed at midnight every night to give her herself something stable in her life. Maybe she takes a break from her studies every day at 3 p.m. to go for a walk. She gets outside. Maybe she connects with a roommate, makes dinner together every Friday night. So she finds some normal rhythms to put into her life to create connection with others, but also to create some stability in a place where she feels disoriented or really messy in the midst of change. And then um, once Dasha has made it through the neutral zone, she can celebrate. She has arrived at the new beginning. And at this point, Dasha is glad that she stuck with it. And I hear this from students all the time that most, not always in the moment will they say, I'm ready to quit, I'm ready to give up, I'm ready to go home. But when they persevere, even if they haven't named those things aloud in the moment. Later they reflect on it and they say, I'm so glad I didn't give up when I wanted to. I'm so glad I persevered because moving through the neutral zone into a space of embracing the new beginning um, brings a lot of goodness, excitement to explore your new home, maybe excitement to get to know floor mates or classmates, maybe an excitement, a deeper excitement about what you're learning or how you're gonna use it to transform your community or your city in the future. Dasha might also find a new identity that she's found some things in the midst of this process that she really enjoys. Maybe cooking or maybe biking or maybe photography. So it is in this space of moving through all of these transitions that Dasha has learned something new about herself throughout the process. So I wonder what transition you're currently going through, or maybe what transition you're anticipating. No matter where you are in the midst of transition, knowing these phases and what to expect can be really helpful. The goal for each of us is to move through these phases so that we can fully embrace the new beginning. So as we wrap up, here are a few questions for you to consider. What is it time for me to let go of if you're in the ending phase? 
how will I spend my time in the neutral zone? If I'm there now, or maybe if I anticipate being in that neutral zone soon. And what is this new beginning going to require of me or of others? These are great questions to consider in this process. And I hope you'll take a few time, a few moments in the next couple of days to consider these. Sometimes we think um, it is only our goals or our dreams that matter. But really, as Emerson points out in this quote, what is really great is not just our dreams, but it's the way that we navigate transitions and change. This is what makes a person really great. And when we steward change and transition well in our lives, we might be surprised by the pearl in the end. I wanna thank you uh, for joining me for LCC Academy today. It's been good to be with you. And I'll hand it back over to Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you for your thoughts and um, also the time and dedication that you put into this. So I'll just share my screen with the questions that we have. And I guess that's what we'll have time for. So the first one, if you see it, um, Therese, is, is divorce of your parents always a bad thing? Um, there are a lot of kids who have parents with toxic relationships, so I don't think it's 100% bad. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I agree with you. I don't think um, divorce is always a bad thing, that there can be um, situations maybe where it is unsafe and in a home or in the relationships of parents. And um, so I think um, probably with most transitions or change, there's not always something that is 100% bad or 100% good. There's often a mixture in the middle between both of those. So that's a really great point. Thank you, Anonymous, for pointing that out. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of transitions anyway with divorce yeah. of parents, so yeah. And then the other one, do you think that letting go of an old identity might result in a new one, but worse identity or a new and better identity? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I think sometimes um, in the midst of transition and change, especially if we don't manage it well, um, we can let go of an old identity. Maybe that was... Um, really significant and important and maybe embrace something that is counter to our values or um, to who we are created to be. And I, so I think it can be dangerous. And I think that's part of the reason that it's important to pay attention to how we manage transitions because um, if we don't manage them well, then um, we might be easily influenced by things around us to manage them in unhealthy ways. And in that to take on an identity that actually is not better than the old one, but actually is worse. So I think that's a really great point, Darina, that um, it is really important um, to manage them well so that new identities that we're embracing or um, new things that we're um, learning about ourselves can actually help move us forward and um, not uh, um, cause us to embrace something that is counter to, to who we are, to our family values, or to what's really significant to us. All right, so our time has ended. Thank you so much, Therese, and thank you so much to all who joined. That is it for today. So have a good rest of your evening uh, or day, whatever time it is where you are, and um, bye.